we're proud of ourselves and we're not going to go down. If you want to come in here and tell us what to do, we're going to throw your ass out. And if you try to stop that, we're going to kill you. I'm pulling my knife out and I'm fighting to death. They want to fight, they'll get one. The concept of the IQ shredder is an especially useful term for those who wish to fully understand the problem of first world birth rates, brain drain, and their links to heritable intelligence. The concept of the IQ shredder originated in a blog post by Spandrel called Yu Kuang Yu Drains Your Brains for Short Term Gains. In this blog, Spandrel has a hypothetical conversation with the former Prime Minister of Singapore, Lee Kuang Yu. The latter part of the conversation goes as follows. Quote, to have a nation, you must have people, and you must have young people to be able to drive the economy and young people to buy the products. All of these gadgets and fine dining, and if you don't have that, and you refuse migrants as the Japanese do, you will dissolve into nothingness. I think before that comes, they may change their policy. A question on China's one-child policy was also raised during the dialogue. Mr. Li said China is heading in the wrong direction with this policy as a shrinking and aging population will mean assets such as property prices will go down. Property prices will go down, assets will go down. There is no younger generation to put the pressure up, so I think it is heading towards the wrong direction, said Mr. Lee. He added, Singapore is in a similar position with its low fertility rate, but the difference is that Singapore takes in migrants to make up for the numbers. Mr. Lee pointed out that authorities here maintain a certain quality of control, and that there is one reason why he feels other emerging ASEAN economies are unlikely to surpass Singapore anytime soon. Mr. Lee said, Said they will make progress, but if you look at the per capita they have got, the differences are so wide. We have the advantage of quality control of the people who come in, so we have bright Indians, bright Chinese, bright Caucasians, so the increase in population means an increase in talent." Unquote. Spandrel responded to the Singapore productivity system with the following criticism. Quote, How many bright Indians and bright Chinese are there, Harry? Surely they are not infinite. And what do they do in Singapore? Well, they engage in the finance and marketing rat race and depress their fertility to 0.78, wasting valuable genes so your property prices don't go down. Singapore is an IQ shredder, and using Japan as a boogeyman, Japan has 120 million people. How many bright Chinese and bright Indians is Japan supposed to take in to offset their demographic decline? 10 million? Do they exist in those numbers? And what then? Would they show any allegiance towards the Japanese nation? Of course not. But what does he care? What's important is those property prices. And fine dining. Unquote. Singapore is an IQ shredder. It is an economically productive metropolis that sucks in bright and productive minds with opportunities and amusements at the cost of having a demographically unsustainable family unit. Malcolm Pollock defines the specific regional problem of Singapore in his blog entitled The Problem of Singapore. Quote, Given the high heritability of these desirable cognitive and behavioral traits, Singapore is effectively a kind of black hole that continuously sucks in industrious, conscientious, high IQ individuals from all over the world and removes their genomes from the future human population, hence the term IQ shredder." Unquote. Nick Land, in his response to Spandrel, clarifies the mechanics of the IQ shredder. Quote, How does an IQ shredder work? The basic machinery is not difficult to describe once its profound socio-historical irony is appreciated. The model IQ Shredder is a high-performance capitalistic polity with a strong neo-reactionary bias. 1. Its level of civilization and social order is such that it is attractive to talented and competent people. 2. Its immigration policy is unapologetically selective, i.e. first order eugenic. 3. It sustains an economic structure that is remarkably effective at extracting productive activity from all available adults. 4. It is efficiently specialized within a wider commercial network to which it provides valuable goods and services, and from which it draws economic and demographic resources. In sum, it skims the human genetic stock, regionally and even globally, in large part due to the exceptional opportunity it provides for the conversion of bioprivileged human capital into economic value. From a strictly capitalistic perspective, genetic quality is comparatively wasted anywhere else. 
Consequently, spontaneous currents of economic incentive suck in talent to optimize its exploitation." Unquote. Malcolm Pollock and Nick Land both responded to the broader implications of IQ shutters as it relates to healthy, growing civilizations in two different ways, one as a cyclical historical phenomenon and the other as an acceleration that could circumvent historical demographic problems. However, both agree that the fundamental engine of productivity is the urban socioeconomic centers that are fueled by immigration from the hinterlands. Pollock discusses the cyclical view of of the demographic IQ shredder. Quote, Observers of life cycles of civilizations long ago noticed that there is a natural demographic process that tends to enfeeble high civilizations as they reach their apogee. The idea is that civilizations advance, they create more and more knowledge, literature, art, etc., and that for civilization to continue to advance requires that there be enough people for each succeeding generation with cognitive and behavioral capacity to absorb it all and carry it forward. The fact that these traits are highly heritable means that those in each generation who possess these necessary qualities must maintain a certain rate of fertility in order to ensure that these will be a large enough pool of such resources in the next generation. The problem, however, is that high civilizations offer a great many agreeable distractions and diversions for these cognitive elites, not least of which is the work of building upon the knowledge and culture passed to them from their antecedent generation. And so the messy, expensive, and time-consuming work of raising children becomes less and less attractive. Once the fertility rate drops below a certain critical point, there simply aren't enough children su of sufficient quality to shoulder the load, and the whole structure becomes more and more top-heavy. Eventually, it collapses. This has happened again and again throughout history." Unquote. Nick Land acknowledges the fundamental problem of demographic and IQ stagnation in his blog post, Modernity's Fertility Problem. Quote, Modernity has a fertility problem. When elevated to the zenith of savage irony, formulation runs. At the demographic level, modernity selects systematically against modern populations. The people it prefers, it consumes. Without gross exaggeration, this endogenous tendency tends to be seen as an existential risk to the modern world. It threatens to bring the entire global order crashing down around it. In order to discuss this implicit catastrophe, it's first necessary to talk about cities, which is a conversation that has already begun. To state the problem crudely, but with confidence, cities are population sinks. Historian William McNeil explains the basics. Urbanization, from its origins, has tended relentlessly to convert children from productive assets into objects of luxury consumption. All of the archaic economic incentives related to fertility are inverted." Unquote. Nick Land points the finger at the exorbitant cost of child rearing and cosmopolitan social trends as the culprits of sub-replacement birth rates in cities. He starts with the cost of raising a kid in a city. Quote, education expenses alone explain much of this. School fees are by far the most effective contraceptive technology ever conceived. To raise a child in an urban environment is nothing like rural precedent ever prepared for. Even if responsible parenting were the sole motivation in play, the compressive effect on family size would be extreme." Unquote. Land then focuses in on the anti-religious cosmopolitanism that is present in virtually every city. Quote, Major cities have always been distinctly cosmopolitan, but for the initial phase of their histories, the bulk of their demographic absorption has been limited to their own ethnic hinterlands. Urbanization meant, first of all, the conversion of rural populations into city dwellers. In the developing world, it still means this. In the most advanced modern societies, however, domestic rural populations were almost fully consumed, reduced to some negligible fraction of the national total. After this point, the process of population replacement intrinsically to the urban phenomenon from its beginning became inextricably bound to globalization and transnational migration flows." Unquote. Although cosmopolitan morality is endemic to cities, the modern ideologies of feminism, individualism, and secularism are a particularly depressive demographic force. Quote, Feminism has been the first inevitable target. It is tightly correlated with the collapse of fertility and is something modernity tends strongly to promote. The expansion of 
female social opportunities beyond obligate child rearing could scarcely lead to anything other than a drastic contraction of family size. The inexorable modern trend to social decoding, i.e. to the production of an abstract contractual agency in place of concretely determined persons, makes the expansion of such opportunities apparently uncontainable. The individualism fostered by urban life might, to counterfactual imagination, have been in some way restricted to males. But as a matter of actual fact, the dereliction of traditional social roles has proceeded without serious limitation, with variation in speed, but no indication of alternative direction. The radically decoded internet persona, optionally anonymous, fabricated, and self-defining, seems no more than an extrapolation from emergent norms in urban existence. Feminist assumptions, at least in their first wave liberal form, are integral to the modern city. Fertility is increasingly identified as a conservative eccentricity, legitimately targeted by partisan political warfare. Intense backlash has been among the results, providing fertile ground for the post-conciliatory far-right." You can subsidize children all you want, but the cities will always be too expensive to raise large families, and the cosmopolitan culture will always be there to deconstruct pronatalist behavior. Alright, so cities are brain drains and demographic drains. But what does Nick Land have to say about ethnic demographic replacement? Quote, the incendiary language of migration-driven genocide is not going away. It is bound, on the contrary, to spread and intensify. The reemergence of the race topic and all of its associates is deeply baked into the modernist cake. Comparative modernity is automatically racialized once global metabolism lends differential urban-rural fertility in its ethnic specificity. What is unfolding, among other things, is the racial disaggregation of the population bomb with its drastic inevitability. This is not a product of intellectuals, but of the modern process inherently, and all attempts by intellectuals to obstruct its cultural condensation are hubristically misconceived. Who actually is having kids? It is a species of insanity to think this question can be strangled in the crib. So, what's the answer? Does the alt-right have one? If so, there's been no sign of it yet. Burn the cities to the ground has been floated on Twitter, but no doubt anywhere else. But it doesn't seem obviously practical. That solution has a rich, specifically East Asian communist pedigree, which the alt-right will probably rediscover at some point. It didn't work in the 1970s and would be unlikely to perform any more convincingly today." Unquote. So Nick Land has jettisoned the Pol Pot option, but where does that leave us? Nick Land does not believe that there is a solution to the modernity IQ shredder problem, so he might as well step over it with technology. Land says in his post-IQ shredders, quote, there are all kinds of anti-tech com arguments that impress people who don't like techno-commercialism, anything appealing to a feudal sensibility with low tolerance for chaos and instability and irreverence for traditional hierarchies and modes of life will do." Unquote. However, Nick Land has a clear pill. Quote, the most hardcore capitalist response to this is to double down on the anti-humanist accelerationism. This genetic burn rate is obviously unsustainable, so we need to convert the human species into auto-intelligenic, robotized capital as fast as possible before the whole process goes down in flames. I don't expect this suggestion to be well received in reactionary circles. If you think this sounds simply horrific, this argument is not for you. You don't need it. If, on the other hand, it conjures up a vision of terrestrial paradise, as it does for the magnetized migrants it draws in, then you need to follow it carefully. The most advanced models of neo-reactionary social order on Earth work like this. Hong Kong and Singapore, combining resilient ethnic traditions with super dynamic technomic performance to produce an open yet self-protective, civilized, socially tranquil, high-growth enclave of outstanding broad-spectrum functionality." Unquote. In other words, the only way to solve the human IQ problem is to automate away the need for human IQs. The IQ shredder is speeding up, so the only way to overcome the problem is by outrunning it with technology. In my estimation, there's something truly horrific about humanity's economy being driven by artificial intelligence. 
read James Burnham's managerial elites and come to the realization that machine-like humans operate the bureaucracies that keep modern economies and social ecosystems alive. Read Nick Land to get a hazy glimpse of the human-like machines that are likely to absorb mankind into the machinations of global capital. But that may be a good thing. You don't want to live like a savage, do you? You, watching this video on your screen, you're infected with the modernity bug too. You're a rootless, semi-anonymous e-citizen. Now be absorbed into the IQ shredder-free future of neo-reactionary techno-commercialism.